Let me uh, ask you, if I may, about uh, Grigory Perlman. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you try to be careful in your work and not let a problem completely consume you. Just you really fall in love with the problem and really cannot rest until you solve it. But you also hasted to add that sometimes this approach actually can be very successful. Mm -hmm. And the example you gave is Gregory Perlman, who proved the Poincaré conjecture and did so by working alone for seven years with basically little contact with the outside world. Can you explain this one Millennial Prize problem that's been solved, Poincaré conjecture, and maybe speak to the journey that Gregory Perlman's been on? All right, so it's it's a question about curved spaces. Earth is a good example. So I was thinking it was a 2D surface. In just being round, you know, it could maybe be a torus with a hole in it, or it could have many holes. And there are, there are many different topologies a priori that, that a surface could have, um, even if you assume that it's, it's bounded and, and, uh, and, and smooth and so forth. So we've, we have figured out how to classify surfaces. As a first approximation, uh, everything is determined by something called the genus, how many holes it has. So a sphere has genus zero, a donut has genus one, and so forth. And one way you can tell these surfaces apart, probably the sphere has, which is called simply connected. If you take any closed loop on the sphere, like a big closed loop rope, you can contract it to a point and while staying on the surface. And the sphere has this property, but a torus doesn't. Uh, if you're on a torus and you, you take a rope that goes around, say, the, the outer diameter mm -hmm. torus, there's no way, it, it can't get through the hole. There's no way to, to contract it to a point. So it turns out that the, the, the sphere is the only surface with this property of contractibility, I mean, up to like continuous deformations of the sphere. So um, there's things that I want to call topologically um, equivalent of the sphere. So Poincaré asked the same question in higher dimensions. Um, so this it becomes hard to visualize uh, because um, surface you can think of as embedded in three dimensions, but a, a curved three space we don't have good intuition of four D space to to, to live in. And then there are also three D spaces that can't even fit into, into four dimensions. You need five or six or so, or higher. But anyway, uh, mathematically you can still pose this question that if you have a bounded three dimensional space now, which is also has this simply connected property that every loop can be contracted, can you turn it into a three dimensional version of the sphere? And so this is the point great conjecture. Weirdly, in higher dimensions, four and five, it was actually easier. So the, uh, it was solved first in higher dimensions. There's somehow more room to do the deformation. It's easier to 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 move things around to, to, to be a sphere. But three was really hard. So people tried many approaches. There's sort of combinatorial approaches where you chop up the the, the surface into little triangles or, or tetrahedra, and you, you you just try to argue based on how the faces interact with each other. Um, there were um, Algebraic approaches. Uh, there's there's various algebraic objects, uh, like things called the fundamental group, that you can attach to these homology and cohomology and and and, and all these very fancy tools. Um, they also didn't quite work. Um, but Richard Hamilton's proposed a um, partial differential equations approach. So you take um, you take so the problem is that you so you have this object which is sort of secretly is a sphere, but it's given to you in a, in a really um, in in a weird way. So it's like, I think of a ball that's been kind of crumpled up and twisted, and it's not obvious that it's a ball. Um, but um, like if you, if you have some sort of surface which is, which is a deformed sphere, you could, um, uh, you could, for example, think of it as the surface of a balloon. You could try to inflate it. You, you blow it up. Um, and naturally, as you fill it with air, um, the, the wrinkles will sort of smooth out, and it will turn into um, um, a nice round sphere. Um, uh, unless, of course, it was a torus or something, in which case it would get stuck at some point. Like if you inflate a torus, it, it would, there would be a, a point in the middle. When the inner ring shrinks to zero, you get a, you get a singularity, and you, you can't blow up any further. Uh, you can't flow any further. So he created this flow, which is now called Ricci flow, which is a way of taking a, an arbitrary surface or, or space and smoothing it out to make it rounder and rounder to make it look like a sphere. And he wanted to show that, that either uh, this process would give you a sphere or it would create a singularity. Um, actually, very much like how PDEs either have, they have global regularity or finite time blow up. Like it, it basically, it's almost exactly, exactly the same thing. It's all connected. Um, and, so, and, and he showed that for two dimensions, two dimensional surfaces, um, uh, if you start as something connected, no singularity is ever formed. Um, you, you never ran into trouble. And you could flow, and, and it will give you a sphere. Mm. And it, so he, he got a new proof of the two-dimensional result. But by the way, that's a beautiful explanation of reach your flow and its application in this context. How difficult is the mathematics here, like for the 2D case? Is it yeah, these are quite sophisticated equations on par with the Einstein equations. Of yeah. the, slightly simpler, but um, um, yeah. But, but they were considered hard nonlinear equations to solve. Um, and there's lots of special tricks in 2D that, that, that helped. But in 3D, 
the problem was that uh, th this equation was actually supercritical. So it has the same problems as Navier-Stokes. As you blow up, um, maybe the curvature could get concentrated in finer, smaller, and smaller regions, and it it, um, it looked more and more nonlinear, and things just looked worse and worse. And there could be all kinds of singularities that, that showed up. Um, some singularities, um, like if, if uh, there's these things called neck pinches, where where the uh, the surface sort of behaves like a, like a like a, a barbell and it, it pinches at a point. Some some singularities are simple enough that you can sort of see what to do next. You just make a snip and then you can turn one surface into two and evolve them separately. But there was, there was a, the, the the prospect that there's some really nasty like knotted singularities showed up that you you couldn't see how to um, resolve in any way uh, that you couldn't do any surgery to. Um, so you need to classify all the singularities. Like, what are all the possible ways that things can go wrong? Um, so what Perlman did was, it, first of all, he he made the problem. He turned the problem from a supercritical problem to a critical problem. Um, I said before about how um, the invention of the of, of energy, the Hamiltonian, like really clarified um, Newtonian mechanics. Um, uh, so he introduced uh, something which is now called Perlman's reduced volume and Perlman's entropy. Um, he introduced new quantities, kind of like energy, that looked the same at every single scale, and turned the problem into a, a critical one, where the nonlinearities actually suddenly looked a lot less scary than they did before. Um, and then he had to solve. He still had to analyze the singularities of this critical problem, uh, and that itself was a problem similar to this wave mapping I worked on, actually. Um, so on the on the level of difficulty of that, so he managed to classify all the singularities. Of this problem and show how to apply surgery to each of these, and through that was able to to resolve the point conjecture. So, um, quite uh, like a lot of really ambitious steps, um, and like like nothing that a large language model today, for example, could. I mean, um, at best, uh, I could imagine a model proposing this idea as one of hundreds of different things to try, um, but the other ninety nine would be complete dead ends. But you'd only find out after months of, of work. He must have had some. Sense that this was the right track to pursue because, like, you know, it, it takes years to get them from A to B. So you've done, like you said, actually, you see, even strictly mathematically, but more broadly, in terms of the process, you've done s similarly difficult things. What what can you infer from the process he was going through? Because he was doing it alone. What are some low points in a process like that? When you start to like, you've mentioned hardship, like uh, AI doesn't know. When it's yeah. failing, what, what happens to you? You're sitting in your office when you realize the thing you did for the last few days, maybe weeks, yeah, is a failure. Well, for me, I switched to a different problem. <laughs> uh, so, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm a fox. I'm not a hedgehog. But you legitimately, that is a break that you can take is is to step away and look at a yeah. different problem. Yeah, you can modify the problem too. Um, I mean, um, yeah, you can ask some cheat. Uh, if if there's a specific thing that's blocking you, that that this, um, some a bad case keeps showing up that 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 for which your tool doesn't work. You can just assume by fiat this this bad case doesn't occur. So you you do some magical thinking, um, for the you know, but 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 strategically, okay, for the point to see if the rest of the argument goes through. Um, if there's multiple problems uh, with 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 your approach, then maybe you just give up. Okay, mm -hmm. but if this is the only problem that you know, and everything else checks out, you know, then it's still worth fighting. Um, so yeah, you have to do some some sort of forward reconnaissance sometimes. <laughs> to, uh, you know, and that is sometimes productive to assume like, okay, we'll figure it out. Oh yeah, yeah eventually. Yeah. Um, sometimes actually, it's, it's even productive to make mistakes. So um, one of the, I mean, um, there was a project which actually uh, we won some prizes for. Actually, but, um, with four other people, um, we worked on this PDE problem again. Actually, this blow off regularity type problem, um, and it, it was considered very hard. Um, Jean Bourguin, um, uh, who was a, another field specialist, who worked on a, on a special case of this, but he could not solve the general case. Um, and we worked on this problem for two months, and we found we thought we solved it. We, we had this this cute argument that if everything fit, and we were excited. Uh, we were planning celebrationary um, to all get together and have champagne or something. Um, and we started writing it up. Um, and one of, one of us, not me actually, but another co-author, said, "Oh, um, in this in this lemma here, we." Um, we have to estimate these thirteen terms that sh that show up in this expansion, and we estimate twelve of them. But in our notes, I can't find the, the estimation of the thirteenth. Can you? Can someone supply that? And I said, "Sure, I'll look at this." And uh, you, uh, yeah, we didn't cover. The, we completely omitted this term, and this term turned out to be worse than the other twelve terms put together. Um, in fact, we could not estimate this term, um, and we tried for a few more months uh, and all different permutations. And there was always this one thing, one term that we could not control. Um, and so, like um, this, was very frustrating. 
Um, but because we had already invested months and months of effort in this already, um, we stuck at this. We, we tried increasingly desperate things and, and crazy things. Um, and after two years, we found an approach which was actually somewhat different, but quite a bit from our initial um, strategy, which did actually didn't generate these problematic terms and, and, and actually solved the problem. So we, we solved the problem after two years. But if we hadn't had that initial false dawn of nearly solving the problem, we would have given up by month two or something and, and worked on an easier problem. Um, yeah, if we had known it would take two years, not sure we would have started the project. Yeah, you know, sometimes actually having the incorrect, you know, it's, it's like Columbus traveling in the new, new world, they had an incorrect version of the measurement of the earth, size of the earth. Um, he thought he was going to find a new, new trade route to India. Uh, or at least that was how he s sold it in his prospectus. I mean, it, it could be that he actually secretly knew, but just on a psychological element, do you have like emotional or like self doubt that just overwhelms you moments like that? You know, because th this stuff, it feels like math it's is so engrossing that like it can break you when you like invest so much yourself in the problem and then it turns out wrong you could start to similar way chess has broken some people yeah um i i think different mathematicians have different levels of emotional investment in what they do i mean i think for some people it's just a job you know you you have a problem and if it doesn't work out you you work on, you work on the next one um yeah, so the fact that you can always move on to another problem, um, it reduces the emotional connection. I mean, there are cases, you know, so there are certain problems that are what are called mathematical diseases where, where, where people just latch on to that one problem and they spend years and years thinking about nothing but that one problem. And, and um, you know, maybe the, their career suffers and so forth. They say, oh, but okay, this big win, this will, you know, once I, once I, Finish this problem. I will, that will, will make up for all the years of of of, of lost opportunity. And that, that's that's. I mean, occasionally, occasionally it works, but I, I, um, I really don't recommend it for people who've got the, the right fortitude. Yeah. So I I've never been super invested in any one problem. Um, one thing that helps is that we don't need to call our problems in advance. Uh, we, um, well. Uh, when we do grant proposals, uh, we sort of say we will, we will study this set of problems, but even though we don't promise definitely by five years, I will supply a proof of all these things. You know, we, um, you promise to make some progress or discover some interesting phenomena. Uh, and maybe you don't solve the problem, but you find some related problem that you, you, you can say something new about. Uh, and that's, that's a much more feasible task.